So we will now come to Jane's second talk, where she uses the model system C elements to understand the process of neuron degeneration, which has multiple contributions from transport and other development practices. All right. Okay. So. Um, all right, so um, I don't usually hear myself talking about diseases and the relevance, but that's um, <coughs> because I'm very much interested in the basic mechanism. But for this one, the, uh, it's kind of a, a detour of my long term interest into a topic that has to do with uh, diseases. Okay, so the idea of axon regeneration or the field of axon regeneration. Has a long history starting from Roman and Kahal based uh, over 100 years ago. Essentially, I guess um, we collect a bunch of really smart students and a lot of anatomical studies, and the question is that you know, once the nervous system is about anomaly, do they have the ability to repair themselves? And that's very different from the non neuronal cells of where they have plenty of um, cell division proliferation activities, where it's long known neurons once differentiated, they don't actually divide and they don't uh, regrow. Okay, so in the book that's now over um, 20 years, and Roman Kaha made the observation that pretty much laid down what we know about axon regeneration even after the stage. Okay, so what you see here essentially is a, a, a microscope uh, image, and here is what they apply a, a cut by knife, and what you see here is the axon basically ended up with so called dystrophic ball, that is the axon is not able to regenerate. Although you see there's certain sort of a sprouting and uh, like those activities as here. And um, when you summarize it out of this 500 pages of a uh, 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 book, is that in the nerve, and what they're referring to the nerve is actually peripheral nervous system, and there seems to be regenerative response, it's called restoration, it's not a revolution, it work again with uh, rapidity and activity, and can be stimulated that also and eventually repair themselves. Why the centers is really is a word for central nervous system is quite contrary, and that is there's the empathy and the precarious productive attempts, initial attempts, and seems to stop, but eventually activities. <laughs> so the observation that is um, damage to the nerve in the periphery, they can regrow, they can repair themselves. Damage to the central nerve, basically they don't regrow. Okay, nonetheless, and we like this work um, in the central nerve, and there is seems to be regeneration uh, purposeless, supported, and actually ineffective in their recovery study. So, following this advice for 100 years, has not been studied um, what, is, what makes the neuron uh, unable to regenerate after injury, and what strategies you can come along and to get those actions to regenerate. And based on his already observation, basically the research field divides itself into two camps. And this is uh, a very kind of classical landmark set of experiments by doing transplantation type experiments. That is, the first one, a, a graft of the periphery nerve, which contain the periphery myelin, into the central nerve, central nervous system environment. What they end up finding is that the injured semen can then evolve into the periphery graft. So that uh, hypothesis is that first of all, actually central nerve can regenerate, and they can the not only they don't regenerate because the CMS uh, myelin contains inhibitor factors. Okay, so that led a group of researchers going after what is the myelin. Uh, inhibitors that's present in the central nervous system, and through so about chemical irritations, pharmacology, 
a set of black locations to identify and so on the logo on or my GP or um, sugar proteins that get contracted and solid protein collecting. And um, this perhaps the identification of non-associated molecules has dominated for a long time in the 1990s or early 2000s. But in recent years, that by doing uh, mouse transgenic mouse and not being done, and a triple combination, multiple combinations, there's no single evidence suggesting those molecules actually are endogenous mining inhibitors for regenerative enzymes. Now, if you remove them all, injured single enzymes will still not go. And the same kind of transmutation experiment and made the other school of researchers and the search for what we know the injured single enzymes, in fact, are able to do well, right? They just don't make them well. well. So what can we do to rejuvenate the regenerative capacity intrinsically to those established axons? And, um, and those are what we've done in a variety of model algorithms and eventually we choose primarily are not for signaling second messenger systems, uh, P10 in the recent years, and protein translation pathways, or um, specific transcription factors. Okay, so it's a lot of progress made since the last days, but the point here is that the search for regeneration factors primarily rely on interfering antibodies and pharmacology and hemorrhage gene scattering. And they can only, most of this research is done in large organisms because you can apply mechanical force using scaffolds in many ways to injure the cells. Very uh, reminiscent or similar to the human um, exon spinal cord injury. So we work on the elegance, and we have already introduced it to you. Everything is fabulous about looking at the development. And um, what I should point out is that the CLGENS has some neurons that are more or less similar in and every component that's conserved with mammals. The CLGENS has so-called glia-like type of cells, but those glia cells do not produce mine. Essentially, the CLGENS axons grow around very naked in a way along the extracellular matrix and such as spatial memory. Okay. And, but we know that there has to be some sort of a gene conservation drive behind this to look for what's in the mature nervous system and how axons can repair themselves and, uh, um, you know, conserve the genes that come this way. But the problem is that the evidence is very small and that that's about 3 meter long as Sandia has shown you the black form that to visualize them, you have to use the microfluid chamber to fix them. Now, to apply the kind of a damage to uh, the other's axons, and we use this technique that Sandia introduced that initially was introduced to us by a uh, physicist, our physicist um, actually applied physicist graduate students of Stanford. And apparently that laser that he was working on, Professor Young, was able to cut glass. Okay. So he said that, well, is there any use of it in an unbiological sample? And then we said, well, maybe we can supply to see all these axons where we can see them as a single label in the geoshoes and then cherries. Sure enough, we took one of the CLS um, label of transgenic worms and applied that um, powerful laser. And you can see that the real time cutting, and the second one is coming in. And so the first one I said, well, I don't think you cut those axons, it probably is a support So there's a possibility until that we finally showed us. So look, this is how axon is truly cut. That's the sort of axon that's in what comes in and sessions. So then with this way, we have a way to serve the axon just the same way as the mouth to um, cut the spinal cord. And we've done a lot of um, laser cutting on different types of neurons. And um, primarily, um, most of our study now will be on the sensory neurons that have been introduced. And the beauty of it is that it has a long axon where we can 
uh, collide injury along different lengths to different regions of the axon. And the other one is that um, it's actually magnitude in which is the, the neurons are named um, the reason is the only set of neurons in boxes in the previous. Okay. And um, so we see here, uh, essentially apply a laser isotomy when the animal reached adults. And 24 hours later, the image was in continuously, but when I read the image from 24 hours later, we see there, you know, this that is robust to regenerate the response. And this say has some things to sprawl this whole place. But um, when you cut the axons in adults, this sprawling pattern is completely different from this developmental stage. Okay, so when I saw this, I, I suddenly felt like, oh, this technique is actually going to have some biological um, uh, use. Why did I say that? Meaning that the, the idea here is not in the cardiac, okay? And um, you can look at the picture, and the axons actually, if you cut those axons in the animals in very young state, and what happens, those axons will repair themselves. That basically ignore the isocytomic and the repro and then to find the targets. Okay. However, when we reach a stage, we cut them in here. Okay. And a few hours later, we see them, they seem to regrow. But they never make it to the organ targets. Or my hair in any way looks like the origin targets. So this suggests to us, or this to me, says that first of all, in the elements when I found the racial adults, they probably lost intrinsic growth ability to recognize cues that <coughs> should guide them to the reference. Or the cues lost in the mouse. In many ways, similar to the vertebrate, what Kaha has been studying is loss of intrinsic growth ability or loss of cues in the environment to guide them or inhibitory cues that increase in the mouse to pick up them and to grow to the backwards. A stretch for this analysis, but it is good stretch, meaning now we can use this acid what are the factors that <coughs> underline this regenerative response? What are the factors that we can manipulate them and to see if they can get them grow better? All right. So um, with the elegance, we wanted to know um, many kind of parameters to set up any kind of genetic strength. We needed to know the parameters and what requirements whether uh, our oxygen bar is this was a known vertebrate dog. Okay, one of the factors is how we know any kind of individual cell or trigger calcium transient. And our reason why I see it is that in axon regeneration, that the messenger system is already been shown as for promoting axon regeneration. So what we did here is to look for how injury triggers calcium transient effects, um, introducing a genetically encoded um, calcium sensors, the G cam, we see in real time you cut, okay, and the color indicates the transient up right and actually propagates back directionally. Um, this transient is fairly variable, that is, individual animals provide a laser input of what has been um, amplitude of calcium transient. Nonetheless, if you plot this calcium transient um, amplitude to the total regrowth extent of branching length, you will see a positive correlation in suggesting the calcium Yeah, okay. Let's try again. That good? Yes. Okay, so um, it says that the calcium transient should, should has a positive role. To promote axon growth, yes. So, uh, do you think that it's a uh, straight check with calcium channel? Yeah, so that, that's the question. And so, there is calcium channel, what kind of channel might be involved? And um, we looked at the spread of calcium channels, 
One of the most impactful channels here to be is a voltage gated calcium channel, okay, and the other one is iPhone 19. That is a lot of reducing iPhone 19 function, we reduce calcium tension, we reduce the total force extent, but we also have inner function calcium channel, and that increases the calcium tension and that increases the total force. But in no case, we're not giving the impression that that promo accurate, just the promo force increase. Okay. Um, in addition, we think there's a slow phase of calcium transit coming from um, intracellular store in the FTC. And um, I won't go through the data, but we uh, use a fossil gas for reasons. We do not become fossil gas using the second messenger. Um, less in the concentration will increase that will generate similar effect as an increase in calcium transit. And this is involving the calcium kinase A. So all of this work is done by the Krishnas, the Kosadi, and India goes through it and now we join them. Yes. Uh, this calcium rate does differ in the development of stages of that's a good question. We haven't looked at the calcium transit in the early, in the young body. It's primarily just the looking in the dots. Yeah. Um, whether the trends will come through the changing in young body to adults, I suspect there will be changes depending on um, any kind of disease, any kind of injury to a cell will trigger transit. But is the transit absolutely Maintains the same from young body to adults with any kind of Yes. Do we see the fact it is snapping back? We do see them um, uh, retract and then basically say just tension. But we're not seeing the beating in this case. Well, this is not the scale of the beating. Do you know what you think about the damage and like the damage to the sun? Right, so this is important. The yellow exon is actually isn't uh, wrapped up with any tissues. Essentially, it is a main exon will grow along uh, extracellular matrix. And we can apply the different force of the laser that will make a bigger bend um, than the tissue, a bigger hole. We can make a very precise pattern without that much So, um, the important thing about this is really is to show that even though the balance of the myelins without any other uh, similarities in terms of the CNS or the PNS and the CNS axon reverse is relying on the second messenger system, same as um, the studies from the others. Yes? The touch mode is wrapped by the PNS, surrounded by the they have hepatron attachment cells, right? So when we cut, we certainly would cut the um, occasion when we can pull to uh, detach the hepatron system. And the question is whether hepatron cells could contribute to pulling. And that kind of thing, we think that there are non cell timing factors coming from hepatron cells but going into the external matrix. Okay. So our whole goal really is using the genetics to find new capacities and new factors that um, more or less based on function, not based on uh, abundance. And the idea here is that CLNS is going on out of genes, and a third of them have directly human homolog. In my first slide, actually, I'm um, missing one thing, is that a lot of times you have to the homolog situation, CLNS only has one gene encodes the stack counting process, whereas in animals is often more than one gene to <coughs> the species. Therefore, we must spend the stack counting with redundancy issues, but not with my local family. Because we don't have that. Even with 7,700 genes, we have to narrow down a bit in the so force. We chose about 2,000 of them because from various people's studies and in the field of work that we know they somehow link to the neuron function and uh, expression. And then here's the best part of it, that is we have CLNS consortiums that generate knockoff mutations. So we actually have about 1,500 of them 
are a couple of deletions. Okay? Because we're looking at adult Alzheimer's generation, we have to can only work on those complete loss of function they survive to adults. Okay, for that, we did the first set of genes, about 750, we published just recently. And the 750 genes by um, function will, will be to both of the nucleus all the way up to the complete cell matrix everywhere. So this, we're not focusing on any specific um, category. And um, that is to do and so, and uh, we have a genetic two box for all the genes that in some ways we can start teasing them apart for the genome transaction pathway and how it is linked together. And the ones we pair on, the best one is uh, the kinases, right? Kinases are generally good uh, pharmacological targets. <laughs> the square map, uh, now half of this surface here is kinases. What you see here is to have a, a measurement uh, scale that is the gray line representing non lines for a wild type. And, um, this is basically means how much they grow from after injury and from forest. And anything above the square bar means loss of function without enhancing growth. So therefore, that gene could potentially enhance inhibitors by some generation. Or anything below the bar elements of loss of function without the use of growth, therefore, that gene is normally required to promote enhancing generation. So only one kinase will do that, that's the atomic generation inhibitor, which can also be the regular transalimus of the protein kinase. That not only acting as an inhibitor of the PKA. On the other hand, there has been multiple genes that come out for kinases that are required for atomic generation. That included some of um, the jump pathways, um, the AKG1 of the two kinases, and the PAC kinases. But the surprise for us is that a whole set of, um, a set of kinases ended up being my old friends, the ELK kinases, as we show here. Okay? So this kinase, now this about an hour ago, I reminded you, they came out developmentally um, as, as suppressors of the Easter bodies. They got a lot of them, they cloned all of them, they come out to be a one single kinase cascade. That in development, that activity of signal output is controlled by this degrading with the E3 bodies. Um, to degrade the upstream DLK kinase, therefore, um, control the kinase output. And, but the fact that I didn't know the kinase means the question of what is the target of the kinase cascade. And then using the same suppressor screen, we identify one of the pieces of transcription factor and come out of this place to the CCAT and cancer-bound protein. All of us can be similar to the craft from the suppressor factor. Furthermore, we show is that this kinase controls the activity of the CC protein primarily through a super-intern with the mRNA regulation. And this is shown on the data here. That is, if you do a QRT analysis of this easy protein transcripts, it's maintained relatively low in wild type. If you remove the history virus, the kinase gets upregulated, and then the level of this transcript is upregulated. And that upregulated regulation depends on the activation of upstream kinase. Because you need more than kinase to reduce the level of activity, and that does not depend on the protein, the CPP1 transcription itself. Okay. Now, the question is there could be uh, transcription or post transcription or MRI stability. So, then what we did is that we cultured the animals in the presence of medicine, and that allows transcription and allows us to measure the kinase. The decay uh, rate of the CCP transcripts, which you will see is in the wild type, it decays about rapidly, and with um, kinase activated condition, the way the survives, the growth rate is much slower, and that then will um, with the DLK kinase. 
Okay. And then the further show is that this three-prime, uh, this uh, unarmed regulation dependent on the three-prime UTR because you basically remove the three-prime UTR and this regulation is disappearing. So this is all sounds good, but then they raise the question of, uh, yeah, so, okay, so I sort of just skip on that, and that's the point in here is that all this regulation applies to the early synapse block, and then it's that it's the high level of the body kindness without the disruption of the synapse formation. But lots of contributions, I think one of the student asked, is actually the superficial block type. Okay. Yes. Like, is the calcium is practically independent of the GFP and how much is so that it would be in the key Okay, so the calcium is instant. Okay, now I'm stepping away from the calcium right now because the calcium was initially then developed to know what happens to the other exact injury. And that then works with this protein kinase A to promote sex on the generation. Now, this is a separate pathway but genetic strength, and keeping this new role of the deoxy kinase is required as part of some regeneration. Okay, but my point is that to putting back in this little one slide is putting back what is downstream of the kinase. Now, what I told you is that this kinase uh, is discovered, rediscovered, or it's known in axon regeneration, is because that's the activator shown here. In the well that you cut, and then the axon will sprout or grow, whereas in the LK, all the system one reasons you cut, and there's no new growth. Okay? And if you elevate the LK activity, you can enhance the total portability. And that depended on its calculus. So essentially, this is rediscovered an old signaling that's reused under new condition. And this time, its role is a positive way to develop. Okay, so, yeah. Do you ever see the group of discoveries of the axon after that? Disco segment. We don't see labels in the disco segment, but they stay there for longer. See, even if the attached to the synapse, still there is no labels. There is no labels. Labels is always coming from the proximal Yeah. Do you see any difference for synapse formation, but it requires further injury in the disco? DLK requires synapse formation. It is what it is. Right, but in a way is that it is high activity needs to be shut down. Okay. Whereas in axon regeneration, it needs to be activated so that high activity promotes regeneration. It's the same model in developing that needs to be negatively inhibited, but in analysis needs to be activated. Okay? And this but it's the same targets. And all involving the three primary TRP and iron regulation. So that brings the question is that in the industry, where is this iron regulation actually happening? Okay. So the wisdom is not asking the question where is an iron able to see if you want to see this now? And so for doing this, it would not be efficient because it becomes the other that is very small. Instead, we did uh, an iron tag. And what this MR tagging is using an iron binding protein that feeds the GP, right? So this iron binding protein will bind to specific binding sites. If you just express an iron binding protein with a GP, you only see them in the soma. But you co-express this um, iron binding protein um, with the CDP1 transcripts that contains the iron binding protein sites. In this is three prime UTR. This double transgene, now we can see the growing fluorescence marking the iron binding protein is present along the axons and then present in the synapses. Essentially, what this suggests to us is that MRA or CDP1 that contains the three prime UTR is present in the axons. Alright? 
I know that we had a lot of talk in the early on about dynamic translation. So the presence of this, it could be just uh, low level dynamic function significance whatsoever. So we needed evidence to show that axon injury actually triggers translation. And for this, then we then used the uh, vendor for the convertible GAP. It's basically new protein for synthesized as a brand for the converting the liquid to bread. If you just uh, use laser to hit the animal without hitting the axon, what you see is that two hours, four hours, this very little brand new protein synthesis, most of them are red. But if you cut it from the axon, okay, within two hours, you see new protein, brain protein synthesized, appears in the soma, but also in the distal segment. Okay, the distal segment is no longer attached to the soma. Okay, and I think you ask the question, this is distal segment, they don't grow, but they actually can synthesize um, new protein. And I think this is probably the strongest evidence we have to show that this local translation. Okay, and this is summarized quantitative there, in this local translation, indeed, it depended on the field of kinase activation because we do the same experiments, we do not see the new brain protein, and um, a couple other people asked the question that we can use the cyclohexamines and to block the appearance of the new brain protein, and we can um, delete from the ETR, which basically remove a non particle localization to axons, and we lost some for the new protein synthesis. To my mind, this, this seems to be a pretty common case that is local axon translation can occur. And at the same time, it also surprised me is that the other axon, in the many years, that they will not get damaged by the laser. Right? There's no reason for the other axon to receive this kind of laser beam um, solid. But somehow, the mechanism of local translation, or the phenomenon of MI local translation, is preserved uh, machinery. And remember, this is the one that axons doesn't even have my use of strong cells coming in. Of course, we are concerned, we haven't actually seen the hard evidence of ribosomes. So, what we did here is essentially see the reconstruction of the cut axons. And um, this is basically one of the soma, this is where the axon cut. And with the limited number, we do see pockets, sometimes in the pockets, and those are microtubules, so those are pockets of what appear to be the public axons. So we still haven't actually firmly identified they are axons by molecular model, but we think morphologically they are polygraphisms that's triggered by um, injury. Okay, so um, essentially this is like um, one totally unexpected um, phenomenon that I actually really truly didn't expect it, is that we, um, by applying the injury of a new model, we rediscover an old kinase cascade of the identified the synapse formation and the zoo regulation of the basic protein and there is a local axon translation technology. The important thing is that the role of the DLT kinase cascade of this entire kinase cascade has been shown that also involves axon regeneration in different types of motor neurons, like Bastion's group, and later on the sophomore class of Collins group in a motor injury, and then ultimately this afternoon we have a discussion about the monster homology is also required. Some regeneration to some degree. <coughs> All right, but I wanted to say is that the question is is this local translation the sole outcome of the activation of this kind of cascade? It's not, but on the other hand, I have to detour um, to a different pathway before I come back to the second part. This detour is, um, as I said, we we'll keep going back to our genetic toolbox. And find a one gene that's not here for six access um, in taxon regeneration inhibitor. And the other six names is because 
is the primary element of the spreadsheet uh, has models so the range of sex seven, and the biochemistry studies have shown that sex seven is the arc space on the large concentric factor. But the data space primary in the models has related proteins as uh, RNAs and um, another family of genes. Even with the data space, uh, four genes, because of this four isoforms, they all have the sex seven domain and the pH domain that includes uh, corticum membrane and corticoid domain as protein interactions. Whereas in the elements, we only have one gene for this one isoform. This is what genetics. Um, that can be found here. So the last one is here in the CFA 6 the micro background will result in an enhanced ion um, regeneration compared to the blockade. And the image on the left hand is telling me is that they do seem to grow longer, but they don't actually grow better. Okay. And this all comes completely coming back to this ion regeneration is unlikely to be controlled by single master regulation. It requires multiple steps in multiple processes to promote the, the accuracy of um, function recovery. Nonetheless, the past and um, now we found this is new uh, potential gene that nobody has ever studied as axon regeneration inhibitor and wanted to know how it works. And the first thing we will do is that that will require the gap activity. And to do so, we uh, have to put the genes back into the mutants by like transgenically. By doing so, we find that it's the level of the other six activity uh, correlated with its axon regeneration um, um, effect. That is, um, compared to the wild type, loss of the other six is out of enhanced results. If we put in just endogenous level of the other six wild type, we will rest here. But surprisingly, if we make a point mutation in the sex domain that's not chemically eliminated gap activity, it also rescues. So that says the gap activity is not required. If we put in a lot of the emphasis that overexpression in the wild time pattern, it actually inhibits um, the uh, external generation compared to the wild type. And that function also is independent of the gap activity. Okay. So it's the level of the events um, seems to be critical for axon regeneration and lose it. It's um, grow better, have too much, and grow less, but now this requires what's the homology event, which basically what people do by the final model the first thing is the homology and the function for this kind of known. Not so then we went ahead and to look for what is the most effective function for men that's involved in this inhibitory and uh, to take uh, lots of data and the, to uh, a simple conclusion is we found rather it is so called the non homologous region of the endoterminus with a small concept of peptide seems to be required um, to inhibit axon regeneration. So in this stage, we need to do a border dissecting the same transaction chemistry. We got stuck. We got a molecule, but nothing, no homology in terms of any role. And we have to say, well, what could we wire things to? And this is where the uh, collaboration comes to quite nicely. That Bruce Bauer at the University of Oregon has actually worked on the FA6 in some two directions. One is they found the FA6 loss of function. Inhibits dying in loss of function in And second, they found is that loss of the other six resulted microtubules to contact the cortex or microtubule uh, by the cortical microtubules to stay longer. So in this context, they linked the other six in a pathway that to microtubule dynamics. And of course, there are similarities between the around the cortex microtubule dynamics and the growth cone microtubules in the past have found lots of interest. And this is a beautiful drawing on this picture that microtubules and um, cellular scales and interactions are the driving force of um, growth cone. Of 
course, we then um, got back to our two bucks. We actually found the different um, many uh, viable mutants for the regular one of the mutants and the body mutants. This is the class and body protein. That is a losing and body protein one. We will reduce axon regeneration in a way similar to the gain of function of overexpressing the MDCs. And um, the axon regeneration inhibitor effect in the MDCs loss of function is dependent on the environment. Moreover, if we're looking at dynamically the growth comp for the EP um, loss of function versus the CFA6 gain of function, it seems to be very large, but they're not more tight. So together, give us hints perhaps that the CFA6 in the neurons is also through controlling the dynamics of the energy. So for that, then we went around to uh, learn all the techniques about how to look at energy dynamics. The best way it comes out is an environment protein GFP marks the growing positive. And what you see here is a movie uh, made by Andy Lear that what you basically see compared to all the images that you have seen, this is a single axon and the diameter of it is less than one axon. Okay. And the movie is not very impressive, but good enough for us to generate um, the kind of that was shown here. All those little wet dots marking the growing microtubules. So the compost um, complex dots as microtubule dynamics that's appeared in treatment of injury and in the wild type of certain numbers. Last in level six, indeed, increase the number of the dynamic microtubules. And then if we just express it with the F6 and terminal without the F and anything else, and that's a gain of function, and then we use the microtubule dynamics. Okay? What about the length of X1 and these mutants? Do they have a shorter X1 length as compared to Y2? Because I was thinking in context of if the if we group is depending on the distance from the cell body and they have short neurons. Then no. So the neuron, the, the developmental way, those axons are same as the wrong type. They don't actually, so the epistis vary as much as the developmental phenotype. This is only primarily triggered by injury. Length of the axon is also more or less similar with the cell Exactly, exactly. So, are they Microtubule mutants by themselves. Yeah, so we have cut mutants as well. The problem with microtubule mutants is the following is that the majority of the microtubule mutants you make a non mutation and there is redundancy. And so that we go to the TB uh, alpha and beta 1 and 2, and then the CD visual has no effect. We make a double mutants, they are best of the environment based so we can look at it. And even in um, the striking microtubules, like 7 and like 12, we see reduced growth. Okay. All right, so this is where um, we then got us from kind of a different angle looking for axon regeneration inhibitors and we led us to microtubule dynamics. But we have a really good um, direct link to microtubules. Yes. Yes. And you see limited to the bit of That's right. So this is the regional increase. So we can do the server that um, measure uh, the increase here as not increase over there. So the reason I ask you is in the some experiments we did in mammalian cells. Uh, depending on which cluster, cluster factor you are using, you see some of them that they can be far away from the mediated control of the growing gene, and others that have the mediated control of the more global gene. So I just wondering how widespread this effect is. Yeah, so this image is basically happens right away within uh, 10 minutes after injury, and we see this fact in the induction within uh, of the injury site, and the stone <coughs> is over here. 
and there we don't see any changes. If without caffeine, and primarily the dynamics is actually between the soul molecules, that's why the tubule is coming out, very little dynamics. Um, to further the support of the link of the other media process to the microbes, and we did the experiment that is, we actually micro injected the taxa into the lung. Okay, so taxa is, you use a large quantity, what does it do? Stabilize the microbes. You use a low level of what does it do? I actually don't know. All I understand is that test cell has dynamic effect depending on the concentration of the use. And um, in generally, in the biochemistry process, is that we um, freeze the microgen because it needs a lot of test Okay. And there are studies of some, as we will come in in a second, by um, Frank Bradford's lab, is that if we drip a uh, test cell in low dose, to injure the spinal cord, that seems to stimulate those common movement. Okay, either directly or indirectly, it's not clear. And the way it here is we inject the test cell at a concentration that essentially has no effect on the wild type microbial dynamics. So then what we're now seeing is that it appears to be a kind of life stimulating microbial dynamics and to bypass the gender function of the Okay, so in this case, this we can feel more confident that the FA6 effect, the blocking um, axon regeneration by the increase of the FA6 level, can be that opposite if we stimulate um, microbial dynamics. And similarly, the results will be fun is that. Here, this is muscle function, which has increased the fact that the dynamics actually can bypass the block of the DLK kinase mutants. Alright? And um, this is why we, the, the power of the CF mutants is going to make double double triple mutants and then give us an idea what additional cell defects that underline the um, DLK kinase cascade. Increasing the dynamics. And can bypass um, DLK. And um, so, just sort of uh, um, when, when, when we were doing the genetic experiments, we realized the connection of the CLNC to the microbial dynamics is about the same time. And Bradley and Sigma Fisher and John Dixie all did is by using different types of microbial uh, inhibitors, cat cells, and a uh, new type of blood function as a way. To apply in vehicle to stimulate some core um, injury axon to grow. But cancer itself is a cancer, it's a drug, and it can be very bad for our cells. And what we're hoping is that the distance could be found in thousands of drug targets for some in vehicle manipulation of microgates. Now, going back to uh, this observation that um, coming back to is that uh, how does then DLP um, link into the microbial dynamics? This is the one in India, and keep doing these dynamic um, imaging studies and look into EDP, uh, GAP in the DLP mutants. And this is all imaging uh, after injury, coming back to that question. Essentially, in a wild type mutants, injury will trigger increase in microbial dynamics, then that translates uh, in a second phase, becoming by doing the uh, power graph, is there's increase of the microbial dynamics. There's also a stable transition, so that the dynamics of the microbial is uh, becoming stabilized. Right. And that's the best way I can do this. It's a not so loss, so this is what I think is happening. You see more comments immediately after injury, and as time goes on, the axon begins to take off growth, and the comments will stay longer, and suggesting it's a microbial lens, the elongation of the and it becomes stabilized. Whereas in the other, lots of functions, both processes 
that is the increase of ocean plankton events just coming to the use, and there's no transition to stabilize the <coughs> So then we wanted to know that what contributes to my activity dynamics and um, this topic has already been introduced to you by the paper labs is that um, post transition modification of activity has long been known and in fact have been long been implicated in each of my activity uh, stability and um, most of the business of the post transition modification occurs at the end of the operative event. That's one of the first things to find that they have the tires in my view. And the towers and basically remove the tower screen to make it um, as lack of the tower screen was actually just become somewhat more stable. And then uh, through the cover of the pathway basically specifically remove more wood weight will then um, generate the delta two form of two when that's extremely stable because they no longer to be accessible to um, the depolymerizing kinds kind of synthesis. <laughs> Okay. Um, this are all worked out on the chemical relation with antibodies, but genetically actually it's been difficult to study them because the enzymes, the specificity of the enzymes, was only known in the recent years. So we looked into the homologs of those enzymes. And for instance, that um, penicillin 13 homolog is here in the gene of 7. What you see is that losing code 7 and there's definitely an increase in activity dynamics of imaging, and um, there seems to be enhanced activity generation compared to base level. And if you overexpression code 7, which will um, reduce basically overexpression code 7, most of the activity transmits is um, the attack in the tumor that's excreted, and then in the lab, it gets reduced activity generation. And we also looked into post transition modification enzymes, and such as actually um, in terms of the deep polymerase and the carboxypathase, which are CCPs. There are only two uh, homologs in the area of CCP1 and 2, and essentially removing either one of them will reduce action regeneration, uh, growth extent, and this one of them is more significant than the other. And this effect can be blocked if the simultaneously removed the curve 7, kinetin 13. Presumably, that what is supporting is that this is a chemical reaction from the transformation to depolarization to generate um, unstable tubular. And here it just shows the antibody setting is that you use delta 2 tubular antibody, which is a stable one, and the well type is present in a certain level. Remove the two cathodes, therefore the two can't become the delta two form, and then you don't see much of the delta two form. Okay. So is this that the patient has not been actually in spite of the ability to do it? You surprised the dogs? Right. Yeah, well, I'm surprised too. Um, but we did not know if those modifications actually happen uh, phase times, and if they happen, either the possibility the modification were there at the beginning, but it's not essential because there's just so much tubular assembly, so much pushing force, and those are the modifications it's not essential. Doesn't make expression impair any kind of function. But in the maintenance phase, and the whole question about it is how do you make sure that some don't keep growing, right? They will stop. In the maintenance phase, it perhaps is the post transition modification now plays a more important role in the maintaining the static state. So, your lab has actually shown that regulation, I think the argument is one of the is important for that. And so, would you find it a crosstalk between that pathway with this one? Mm -hmm. So, this is um, what that leads to a totally different phenomenon. I haven't given up on you because it's too complicated. And um, the point here is that our human 
initially we were working on the synopsis, so I talked about women and then acting uh, regular kinds of vein regeneration. The back regulation has very little. After that, the cell does not have any anti regeneration effects as we have. It just says that same molecules can be used with different ways to see different ways. So when it also looks the converse, is that if we take away uh, one of the uh, TDLs, which was developed by exactly um, what specific post-transitional preparation does, and remove it, it seems to be the opposite of the CPPs, is that they increase the time generation. Okay, so then uh, what's the connection with the DLK pathway? We actually found is that loss of DLK Reduce um, stable on uh, 32 tumor just the same as the CCP1 and 2 double reasons that it's just significantly less stable um, or long lived tumors. And whereas overexpression of the LK and there's increase of tumor, stable on the And what appears to be is that the LK signal and transaction cascade may be uh, regulating. Those post transcription enzymes that are either transcription level or post transcription protein stability level. And that with this, then we keep pushing on the connection of um, activity dynamics and to the DLK. Remember, loss of the FA6, increased activity dynamics that bypass the external generation block. And here we did the same thing, this one in the DLK loss of function reasons. We're moving the microtubule dynamics to more stable, and to more than the to more stable base, and moving the setting so those carotenoids to remain will continue on, and by increasing the CCPs, which pushes to the production of delta two tubulin, and the combination of that can bypass the loss of the DLA line. Okay, so it seems to be two things. Yeah, this is. Increase the macrophage dynamic activities and the um, changing the post macrophage post translation modification capacity to increase long lived tubulin and both can bypass the block of the DLK common soil. Am I right on all of this? Actually, I never learned about the materials, and then good thing the theater is not here, otherwise, it will be Friday. Um, so, with all of this, this is kind of a new direction, but on the other hand, it's been fine that we were able to, uh, use some laser astronomy to establish the field of right on the generation of skeletons. And this will show that early events that triggers the calcium and through the vitamin P pathway is very much conserved in other organisms. And using the, um, genetic screen approach, we now, um, discover two new um, genes that are not being implicated in our time region translation and to promote the same generation. And the, um, in, a, on the network interaction downstream of the LK in the mind um, dynamics of the two interactions, the FA6, and the combination that contributes to um, regenerating ability. I did not talk to you about um, the non cell complex tubes. That works coming in on the basis of um, regeneration. I think those were some, this is where Sandy was um, shown, mentioning that some of the um, non cell time sewers come from the skin, probably operating the labor for regenerating accuracy. Alright, so with that, um, this is just the people thank them. Uh, so I will talk about the certain kinds of. And most of the people who have done the work is Li Jin Chen, um, square head of the genetic screen. Dong Yan is um, with MDR kinase. Um, the question is, Pleasure and Nido is in the last row of unavailable um, imaging for calcium second P and D nitrogen dynamics. And um, my, um, well, I lost it on slides, didn't show up. Um, actually, it was his picture of my long term collaborator. And it's a new new card for this whole project. Right. Thank you.